Mic check. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Now I'm coming. All right. It is 8 a.m. Start a wonderful new day. Um, Bio 104. This is Dr. Grimes, and I'm in record mode. <clears throat> and yet, laryngitis, yet once again. Uh, what are we doing today? First, of course, we'll do what we always do Tuesday morning after action of exam three. Please remember the most important part of any exam is uh, figuring out what you did right, what you did wrong, and and uh, fixing uh, fixing things because. And again, the purpose of education is to learn from your mistakes. Nutrition lecture. Then we're going to go through a nutrition video and nutrition questions. If you noticed, um, uh, I already put questions up in announcements yesterday. We're also going to briefly talk about why Thursday is a special day. Um, why it is important to uh, be here on time because uh, it's going to be a little bit weird. Uh, we have an accreditation visit, and um, uh, we also have to, uh, since we're an anatomy and physiology class, they would like for us to showcase our anatomage. The other class will be in the other lab, and we'll have us um, from um, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. We'll have a special assignment where um, I'll be pulling a group uh, small groups from this class to go to the laboratory, the Anatomage laboratory. It is in this hallway in um, the last door on your left. I'll also put up a sign on the door as well. We'll spread it to groups and we're going to perform um, an Anatomage uh, assignment and that assignment has to be submitted by closing of business a day. Um, it's not only to showcase the Anatomage also to have us uh, have the opportunity to at least play with the anatomons a little bit. And uh, also, um, they'll, they may or may not be calling students uh, and myself between um, between 9 and 10 o'clock uh, mm -hmm. to step out. If I am called uh, to step out, um, again, it'll be open session where um, uh, you can do homework, you can work on your um, presentations because, of course, presentations uh, we start uh, next week, next Tuesday, 8 a.m. promptly. And I'm going to uh, have the Wheel of Fortune up, and then I'm just going to click on it. And whose name comes up, uh, if you're not here at 8 a.m., uh, you got five minutes to get here at 8 a.m. Um, and currently, I'm pretty much preaching to the pulpit right now because all of you guys came in on time. Uh, but for those of you watching uh, at home and, and you are consistently late, um, it's it's going to be a problem because if you can't get if you can't get into a lecture on time, how much more for something important like your shift? Um, another thing we're going to be doing today is how to do assignment submissions because uh, over time um, th there seems to be like a bell curve. During week two, three, everyone's submitting uh, quite well, but come week four, week five, the submissions are getting sparse. Meaning to say is, this is college. If you're asked a question, um, and we're going to show examples of it, um, and um, like for example, like, uh, they had the question like, uh, like why do, uh, why do astronauts? It goes, what are the challenges of astronauts going to Mars? There's more than half of you wrote one sentence that said, because they need oxygen, that's why they wear oxygen tanks. Come on, that's not even a high school answer. Um, I gave it, I gave credit because, you know, you did something, but uh, let's expand on that. We're medical professionals. The reason why you're doing this homework is not busy work. It's not like, I'll admit, high school was busy work. There's a lot of useless repetition and rote memory. Here they're asking you a question to apply something 
that you already now know. Why do we need oxygen? Right? Yes, of course, you need an oxygen tank. Y you know, my two-year-old can tell me that. Right? But uh, those were college-educated people. Expand on it. And related to that is APA format, plagiarism, and citation. There's a couple of you copy and paste stuff. It's super, when you've been teaching a while, um, especially, I told you guys, I, I write very well. So that means uh, I, I can easily pick up on writing styles. It's super, super obvious if you as a student didn't write something. It, uh, like you use words and phrases that sound like a professional would. And it, all it takes is for your professor to copy it, paste it onto Google, and um, there are several, um, like, turn it in. If there's a match, uh, of, I forgot what the standard was, uh, but for me, it's around, if there's a match around 80%, it's considered plagiarism, it's considered cheating. And also, uh, you're going to have your um, uh, presentations next week. All the presentations should be seventh edition APA format. And some of you may have uh, had some of this um, library training. Some of you may have watched the videos, but let's do it all together today so that there is no um, confusion on how to properly cite. Because in the future, all they're going to do is they're just going to give you a zero. Or if you give subpar answers, even though your answer is correct, if it's not expanded on, um, um, they're just, it, it's just, you know, it's just not college level stuff. So that's what, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I saw, uh, over the weekend. And you guys know, you guys have timestamps. About a third of you, uh, do your homework like minutes before it's due. Please don't do that. Don't get into the habit of that. You're in medical. A lot of medical is prep and being ready. Right. So get used to doing things crazy early. And if you have a time management problem, which is usually the majority of the world. Um, uh, I can um, I can also show you some ways to get beyond that, because we as adults, it's super hard to 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 manage study time, submission time, time with my family, time to pay the mortgage, time to do an extra shift work. It, it, it gets, you know, it, it, it gets bogged down to the point where uh, uh, you can't even sleep. But I can show you, I can show you some methods on how to properly allot time. And remember, you should be studying daily. Right? Uh, study is not a, you know, once a week, twice a week. Thing. It is a daily thing. And for, um, for many professionals, we study daily. Uh, at least once in the morning at one, uh, uh, once at night. Because um, the more you see something, what happens? It becomes almost second nature. And the more you see it, you'll have the better capability of getting higher test scores. So that's what we're doing today. So let's look at this after action. That's a question. Yep, shoot. I can't hear. What are they going to be pulling students out of class for? Um, we'll be pulling, they'll be, they may be pulling uh, students and myself just to ask questions. Um, it's an accreditation visit. They ask things like, and if they do pull you out, just be honest. And if you know something, say, yeah, I know something. And if you don't know something, say, I don't know. Right? And, I, and then they'll ask you, if you don't know something, who would you ask? And the go-to is always, I'd ask my teacher or I'll ask my academic advisor. That's it. Um, they're just, they just check up to see if uh, the standard is being met because we're an accredited, uh, we're an accredited body. Um, um, and also accreditation also um, predisposes Title IV funding, which is federal funding. So in order to maintain our federal funding, you have to add accreditation. And also we're in medical. There's accreditation up to our eyeballs. There's at least half a dozen um, government and semi quasi government agencies who will be looking, it goes, looking at every nook and cranny of your department and your performance for the rest of your life. So just know that it's just part and parcel. And they're not here to be punitive or anything like that. 
They're just here to, you know, ask some questions and then um, look at the overview. So, so it's no big, because um, uh, all the all the real interviews are with um, campus management. All right. So that's why uh, Thursday is going to be a little bit special, and of course I'll have um, uh, uh, the activities to adjust for that day. So let's look at this after action. If you look at the stats for the exam, it's pretty good. 86, high scores 100, low scores 70, and you see the standard deviation, meaning that a lot of people didn't deviate from, you know, 80s and 90s, which is uh, the typical uh, passing standard. So let's look at some of the questions. If I'm breathing too fast, right? For the clinicians in the room, how fast is too fast? What's the normal uh, breathing for the medical assistants in the room? It's what, 60 to 100. So greater than 100 is too fast. So if, well, no, well, you know, that's tachycardia, sorry. Breathing is what, 12 to 20. If I am, uh, if I'm breathing too fast, what is that called? Tachypnea, tachy fast. And if I'm breathing too slow, that's called bradypnea. If I'm having difficulty breathing, like wheezing, like right this, right now, I'm coming, I'm, I'm doing all these other things, right? That's called dyspnea. Dyspnea is also called SOB or shortness of breath, right? So those are the... Those are all the things regarding uh, um, uh, breathing um, and breathing medical terminology. Which of the following parts of the respiratory system where is gas exchange? Where is the only place from my nose and my mouth all the way down to my alveoli where there's gas exchange? It's at the level of what? All the way on the inside, alveoli. That's why if you have a low respiratory tract infection, how much trouble are you in? You're in a lot of trouble. Um, next. What do I call food when I chew on it? Bolus. Bolus. And then it goes in the stomach. Then the acids act on it. And then it goes in the duodenum. What's it now called? Chyme. So bolus, bolus, bolus. Then it gets messed around with the stomach. And then it turns into chyme. When I thought chyme was the substance in your stomach. Yeah, so what do we call the processed food that exits the stomach? Chyme. It's not bolus. It's not feces. It's not flatus. Right? I got a couple of you on feces. Right? Yeah, it's not feces yet. Feces is all the way in the large intestine. And feces is waste product. Chyme is still what? It's still under processing. Right? But once it exits, it's out. I go to this small intestine, and then I absorb all the good stuff. And then all the bad stuff gets to go where? Feces. And you can't keep feces. Um, your uh, lung volumes. What's it called in normal breathing? TV or tidal volume. If I, goes, if I inhale as much as I could, that has to be my what? Inspiratory reserve volume. If I exhale as hard as I could, that has to be my expiratory reserve volume, right? So the question was, it goes, uh, which of the uh, following lung capacity is part of your inspiratory? And that was, part of, that was kind of a gimme because your IRV has the word inspiratory in it. And inspiration is what? Breathing in. What's the function of surfactant? It's got to keep everything what? Closed or open? Alveoli should be what? Open, right? I didn't want to put surface tension because, you know, we got a little bit of confusion on that. But if you look at the other questions, do we ever talk about phagocytosis of foreign body? You know, and you already know from last term, uh, what provides mucus in our lungs? Cell. Anatomy and physiology one. What cell makes mucus? Oh, all right, you can look it up. Yeah. But it rhymes with uh, goblet cell, right? So you guys don't remember that? Remember? With the different types of skin, we had epithelial, squamous, 
and then you had the caboidal, and then you had the columnar, and the columnar had pseudostratified columnar, and it had these things look like champagne flutes, and those are goblet cells. That's what makes what? Goobers, gobbers. Like that's where we get the slang from. Which are the following spaces in your upper respiratory? Right now I have sinusitis. So what does my head feel like? It feels like a bowling ball. It's rather painful actually. Because now all the spaces in my head are now filled with what? Mucus, pus, heaven knows what. And remember, pus is, if my white blood cells and the pathogenic bacteria are gonna go to war, in a war, aren't there casualties? Aren't there dead bodies all over the place on the battlefield? That's what pus is. Pus is dead bacteria and um, dead white blood cells. So if you see pus anywhere in your body, don't you think that's something you got to get it out of your body? Because if it stays in your body, dead things beget more dead things. Um, what happens if I ate a large meal at McDonald's? At the time of making this exam, I was eating a large meal from McDonald's. So who gets released from pancreas? Insulin. Now, here's the tricky part. If I take insulin, what happens to my blood sugar? It will go down, right? Let's say I'm starving. But now, a little bit. I haven't eaten since nine, right? So it's been, it's around um, uh, 11 hours or so. So right now, I'm hungry. My blood sugar is what? High or low? Low. So what's my pancreas going to release? Glucagon. Glucagon tells my liver to do what? Break down the glycogen store. And if uh, the glycogen stores glucose, what's going to happen to my blood sugar? It should go up. Now, here's the problem. Let's say, and this is most likely what's going to happen. Let's say I don't eat anything until 4 o'clock. Right? 4 o'clock is quitting time to me. Right? But I got stuff to do. Tutor, blah, 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 whatever. Let's say... I'm remiss and I don't have my lunch. If you have a continued starvation state like diabetics, the glucagon will tell the liver, hey, we need more glucose, but the liver will respond by making ketones. You'll be in a ketotic state. Ketones are like the cheap form of glucose. And you guys know what happens when, what happens when you eat the cheap form of anything? It's not good, is it? Right? So the cheap form of glucose is ketones. And ketones, the problem with ketones are they are neurotoxic. That's why you're not you when you're super, super hungry. If you haven't eaten for a couple of days, or let's say you were sick and you, and you haven't been eating well for the last couple of days, how's your, how's your mood? Bad. You're hyper irritable or the exact opposite. You ever get like really silly? Right? It's also the same thing with hypoxia. If I started slowly lowering uh, the oxygen in this room, one or two things is going to happen. One, you're going to get either really silly, or two, you're going to start to fall asleep. Now, do you notice the two things we talked about? Oxygen and glucose. Those are the two main things that your body needs to live. Without either, what happens? You're dead. So if you stop breathing, you're dead. You stop eating, you're dead. Quite simple equation, actually. Uh, what is the function of your teeth? Or mastication, Mechanical. chewing? Mechanical. What are the function of enzymes? And the low pH of my stomach? That's what? That's chemistry. So that's chemical digestion. Right now, I have no voice. What part of my respiratory is affected right now? Is it my oropharynx, my larynx, or my trachea? Yeah. Larynx. Is it the true fold or the false fold? True fold. You ever notice when you have laryngitis, like, and then you cough, every once in a while you choke a little bit, right? Like um, maybe you're um, just drinking water and you choke a little bit? Because remember we talked about true folds and false fold. The true fold is now affected. If you, the true fold is affected, I can't speak, I have aphonia, right? Don't you think the false fold will also be affected? And what's the function of the false fold? Doesn't it help the, the epiglottis close down the glottis? 
So you'll cough up, uh, cough up water or food a little bit. And that's called dysphagia. And you have a, a little bit hard trouble uh, eating. Oh, speaking of that, this is the one where uh, everyone was all over the place. True folds versus false folds. True fold gives you what? Voice. False fold helps the epiglottis close. Now, I mentioned Adam's apple once. That's your thyroid cartilage. And uh, cricoid cartilage, I mentioned it once. So remember, true folds versus false folds. Um, and uh, a lot of people got that one wrong. The majority, actually. Only six people got that right out of 20. The next one, the majority got it right. Which of the following is the first part of your large intestine? It's your cecum. The first part of your small intestine is your duodenum, right out of uh, the stomach. And the best way to do it is just remember, use the story of the piece of food from the time you put it in your mouth all the way until it ends up in the toilet. Mm -hmm. If you learn it like a story in a sequence, it's a little bit, it'll be a lot easier to remember the, um, the anatomy. Uh, function of the large intestine this is small intestine. Who absorbs water, large or small? Large. It goes, who makes feces? Large. Who uh, goes, um, who absorbs nutrients? Small. It goes, which has a greater, um, uh, um, a greater area of absorption because of the plica scolaris? Small intestine. Because remember, the, um, absorbing water is important. What's 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 uh, not on the scale of things, but they're both important. But absorbing nutrients requires a lot of area. Um, this one, a couple of you got wrong. What is the function of glucagon? And we already talked about glucagon. It will signal the breakdown of glycogen in the liver to increase blood sugar levels. Uh, there were four or five years that got it backwards. Remember. When does glucagon get released? It gets released because when your blood sugar is low. So function of glucagon is to do what? Raise your uh, blood sugar. Next, uh, inhalation versus exhalation. Now, do you notice some? Do you notice a pattern? And I also mentioned in lecture. Anytime you have any um, a comparison slide, like exhalation versus inhalation. Glucagon versus insulin. You see, if you have two sides of the coin, don't you see how easy it was to ask questions? So inhalation versus exhalation. Let's go through all the ones. Which one, which one is an active process? Inhaling or exhaling? Inhaling. inhaling. Which one requires muscles? Inhaling or exhaling? Inhaling. inhaling. And you go, um, which one, uh, uh, which one has a negative pressure to start the process? Inhalation or exhalation? Negative pressure. I have a negative pressure right in my lung, right? Positive pressure outside. So it's always going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. A negative number is what? Low, right? It's less than zero. So air will now go what? In. So that's what? Inhalation. I go, um... Uh, inhalation versus exhalation. He goes, uh, which one takes in oxygen? Inhalation. Which one uh, releases carbon dioxide? Exhalation. So you see how we broke it into like four different things? Couldn't they be four different questions? Oh, by the way, that's how I made this question. I took those four things. I made one true and the other one is false. So that is called a modified true false. If you see a modified true false question, it choose the true state, choose, choose the false state. Treat it like if there's four answers, treat it like four mini true false questions. So go number one, is it true or false? Number two, is it true or false? Number three, is it true or false? Number four, is it true or false? The one that's sticking out is your answer. Okay.
It's the best way to deal with true Uh What is proteinase? The very fact that it has ASE at the end. What does it tell me? It's a what? It's an enzyme. And what do enzymes do? They break down stuff. So a proteinase, what does a proteinase do? It breaks down proteins. A very popular proteinase is Pepsi, right? It's in your stomach. So they break down peptide bonds. And we're going to talk about peptide bonds today when we talk about proteins. How about if I had a lipase? What would a lipase break down? Lipid or fat. What does amylase break down? Carbohydrates, right? And a nuclease, what will a nuclease break down? Either DNA or RNA. So when you look at it, aren't those the four organic materials in our body that, that, that make us different than the composition of this chair, this rug? This chair and this rug, yes, it has carbons and hydrogens in it, but we have proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. That's what makes us different than this desk. And that's called organic chemistry. For uh, for those of you who are ever are going to move forward in your chemistries, an orgo is fun. I like that, and especially the laboratories. It's uh, it's actually a lot more fun than general chemistry. Lung volumes we already talked about. How about the vitamins? Let's run through some of the vitamins because we're going to see them again later today. So vitamin K. What will that do for us? Blood clotting. So if my patient doesn't have vitamin K, what's going to happen? They won't be able to clot. They'll bleed out. Um, vitamin A is retinol for your eyes. Vitamin D is for calcium. You get calcium actually from the sun. I, um, uh, I, think, I think I shared this story with uh, um, the medical terminology class. Um, right after... Right when the the, um, the kids were starting to go back to school slowly, I, of course, had, had the kids have all formal blood work, formal workup. All the children, including myself and my wife, had all vitamin D deficiencies. We drink milk and whatever, right? We eat cheese. But the very fact that we were in the house for months and didn't see the light of day, and um, the workstation in my house is in the, is in the basement. And that's where we have our server. That's where we have all the computers. So me and the kids, we turned the basement into what? Into a school. And we were there all day, every day. Um, actually, it was neat because um, I changed their curriculum. My goodness. I find it, I find it so sad now. Um, well, well, uh, the, the reading list for freshmen and sophomores in high school is so weak. And uh, you, they don't even read the classics anymore. So I, I got my, um, me and my kids, uh, we formed our own book club. Because, again, be responsible for your own education and for your kids' education. Because uh, politics, other stuff, because take a really hard look at your kids' homework. It's stupid. And it's busy work. And it doesn't reinforce anything. Um, so um, I made my because I made my kids um, read real things like they were reading. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, the classics like 1984, um, Hamlet. Um, um, what did me and the kids uh, just recently read um, a, a wonderful book, um, um, Animal Farm. Uh, you want to learn about politics? Read some of these books. Uh, because it's the same tricks that people have been playing on each other for decades, uh, not decades, millennia. And if you look at the word politics, uh, polis means what? People. That's all politics is, it's people controlling. That's what's fun to watch. It's only a semi science. Um, what is the structure? Oh, the structure between your small intestine. And your stomach. So your stomach has two doors. The one on the top is the lower esophageal sphincter, and that is also called the cardiac sphincter, and it leads to your esophagus. But what is the what is the sphincter on the uh, end part of your stomach? 
that you are. Probably more extreme. But everyone got the correct job. Everyone got the next one right. Epiglottis. It's easy. Um, common organ between digestive and respiratory pharynx. That was an easy one. Uh, the, 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 uh, which of the following are parts of the stomach? Everyone got that one. Well, this was another version. And overall, again, good job, uh, class average 86. Uh, I mean, as a teacher, I'm happy if it's 80, but 86 is pretty darn good. Right? And for those of you, if you're not, because it's 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 already week four, right? If you're if if you're still struggling, fix things now because I wish I could say things got easier. Education isn't supposed to get easier. It's supposed to get harder because the more skill sets you learn, the more responsibility you have. And in, in our game, there's a lot of responsibility. So again, great job on this test. Let, um, let us now look at this nutrition lecture, which is part and parcel of digestion. So you're going to, um, and it's going to take you back a little bit. For those of you, you remember your anatomy and physiology one. Who's your professor for AMP one? Who's it? Who's? I wish it was me. Because I was, I was, I always tell the dean, like, because if there's a one, let me teach the one and the two, so there's like continuity. Because I always assume that your professor taught you it or not. But sometimes when I say stuff, you guys look at me glassy eyed. But I had you all also, I had some of you for medical terminology. I asked simple stuff as well. You still look glassy eyed. So I'm like, mm, it could be, it could be just what timing. And remember, in the human body, especially with memory, you don't use it, you uh, you lose it. Like for example, um, uh, I was like a computer nerd, love coding. Uh, if you ask me to do coding now, it takes me so long. I I always have to have another screen with with like my cheat notes. Before I have all the codes in my head. Um, uh, speaking of codes, when I was a medical biller and coder, and when I was teaching it, the codes came right to my head. Now I'm like. Kind of remember it, maybe a little bit. Because why? It's been what? It's been more than a decade. Someone asked me, he goes, hey, do you think you can teach coding now? I'm like, no way. I'd have to redo the whole class and relearn it. So let's look at, um, if you go to modules, and again, let's, uh, let's open up with uh, uh, with a video with that Alton guy. I still don't know his name, even though I've been using his videos for the last 10 years. Crash course. Yes? The crash course. Yeah, the crash course. I just, I, well, that's if it'll let me. It is up. What's up? Oh, see, this is how impatient I am. All right. So again, let's do this exercise because <clears throat> um, in my tutoring over the weekend, right? I always get I always get stuff like, um, uh, why can't Professor Lawrence uh, be my be my professor for the rest? Why can't Professor Davis? be my professor for the rest of the term. Is that realistic? No, and it's also imprint. Whoever was your per first professor, you got used to that person. Odds are that's the person you'll like for all eternity. But our job is, will you have different supervisors, different trainers all throughout the course of your career? You're gonna have some that are being, are, are very animated, and very interesting. And then you're gonna have others that are just quite super boring. I can tell you right now, every I dread taking my continuing medical education because it's. You guys ever watch Charlie Brown? 
And the teacher's like, wah, wah, wah. that's what I feel like. In life. But the problem is I need to extract information because if I don't pass the post test, I get, I lose all my money and I get to take the stupid course all over again. I've done that two or three times in my career. So I learned the lesson of what? Active listening. So let's play the video and I'm gonna pause it at parts. And he goes, and then ask yourself while you're, he goes, or, or you can even play along by opening up a Microsoft Word document and then start asking yourself, what was so important what was said? And all the garbage, you'll do what? Just leave by the wayside. So let's try this metabolism and nutrition. Let's do this one. Right off the bat, he just broke down a human being into categories. And then each category had an example. Doesn't that scream in a, a test question? Like what's a protein? What's a carbohydrate? And remember, always look at whatever is most and whatever is least. What's the most in a human being? Water. Water. So for the clinicians in the room and also for the technicians in the room, what's most important? Dehydration. Because if I don't have enough water, right? Yeah. And then what's the least thing I have to think about? Uh, right? But why do we eat so much? Remember what what remember what Dr. Zhao used to tell me? Because why we as human beings, we're the only animal on the planet that eats beyond our capacity. We're already at full, but we want to do what? So when you look at that. Does the human being need a whole ton of carbs? No. But the human being needs a whole ton of what? Water. There was a study done about 20 years ago. How many of you really drink a lot of water a day? I don't. I drink like lemonade, coffee, all these other things, but not water. Right? Because, but you can see it's so super important. And now it makes sense when we give a diet to our patient. Oh, by the way, water is beautiful regarding diet. We know our stomach, right? If you fill it up with water, it distends. If it distends, don't you think it's going to give a message to my brain? Hey, I'm full. Right? Don't eat anymore. But the problem is that message is via hormones and it takes a while. So that's something interesting. And... I'm pointing it out because remember, I made questions. So right off the bat, you have two things, catabolism and anabolism. And just take the quiz that we just looked over. 
Isn't that two separate things that can be asked? Is it A, is it B, is it both A and B? Is it D, none of the above? It's already, it's already setting you up for that. So construct things and consume energy. Now you know what anabolic steroids are or performance enhancing drugs. What is it doing? It's building muscle mass, right? So my athlete can perform better, right? Bigger muscle, better muscle. But here's the problem. Anabolic steroids consume a large amount of energy because in order to build something, I have to consume it. Remember I told you my nephews, they, they play division one ball, 10 to 12,000 calories per day, per day. And I can tell you right now, they don't, all four of them don't want to admit it, but all four of them have signs and symptoms that they're on PEDs. All four of them, uh, it's obvious that they take some sort of anabolic performance enhancing drug. And that's only, they're only in college. They're not even getting paid. So you can only imagine when you were watching the Super Bowl this Sunday, the, the, level of, the level of chemistry that had to build and to consume energy. So that makes sense. If I want to build something, I'm going to eat up a lot of energy. And what is the met metabolic energy that we all know and love created by our mitochondria? ATP. Remember all that stuff we talked about? Glycolysis, breakdown of sugar, TCA Krebs. Then it went to the oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transfer chain in the mitochondria. And it made what? ATP. And it requires oxygen. It requires glucose. Does that make sense? I breathe. I got to eat a whole ton of food. And the whole ton of food is going to get processed to glucose. So I have oxygen and glucose. So now I'm what? Building. So when you see bodybuilders, they eat a lot. When you see athletes, they eat a lot and they burn a lot of energy. Now, this is everything. Metabolism is the big word. Anabolism and catabolism are under metabolism. So if you look at that, what's, what's catabolism? It's the exact opposite. So that's essentially how you live. You're building up stuff and breaking down stuff at the same time. It's the constant cycle. When you're younger, metabolism is what? Extremely efficient. But what happens when you get older? It gets slower. Hence, now you now understand why, um, uh, why a 10 year old can eat two Big Macs and then do a double header or play football for six hours. And my adult has half a Big Mac and needs a six hour nap. Who's, if you don't keep the machine up, then 
you know, because remember how remember how difficult it was when we were kids, kids as in grade school, to take a nap. As an adult, even if I had a full night's sleep, I could take a nap anywhere. If you told me right now, hey, Dr. Christ, cancel your class, go in the other room, turn off the light, I will sleep. Because my metabolism, right, the ability to build things and to break things down is now much what? Slower. And that book beautiful. It's actually giving your professor a test, a test question. And now it will now make sense. If my patient doesn't get enough calcium, magnesium, or phosphorus, what will happen to their bones? Ladies, why do you think if you're childbearing age and you had kids, why are you at risk for osteoporosis? It is what gets leaked out of your body, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, because all of that stuff is required to make milk. So yes, yet another thing you can blame your kids on. Hemoglobin. You all know that hemoglobin carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. Remember that story that my wife always thinks she's anemic? She always say, oh, my iron levels have to be low. Always thinking that. pH balance, salt, sodium, chloride, and of course, potassium. And Remember what our um, electrolytes do for us. They also turn things on and turn things off. So sodium tends to turn things what? On. Potassium tends to turn things off, in a, in a general speaking. And it, that's the reason why if I want to turn somebody's heart off permanently, I will give them potassium iodide. I'll turn that because I'll make the heart just what? And... Um, uh, mess with the salts. Um, sodium and calcium, those are the two driving forces in your heart and in your uh, muscles. Now, monosaccharides, disaccharides, all of them will have a suffix O-S-E. And O-S-E means sugar. So a starch is actually a sugar, right? But a more complex sugar. So anytime you see fructose, galactose, sucrose, then you now know it's a sugar. And sugars are um, 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 either monosaccharide, disaccharide, or polysaccharide. Mono being one, simple sugar. Disaccharide is two simple sugars glued together. And a polysaccharide is a whole stack of sugars, like starch. Now, everything turns into this six carbon sugar. If ever you see like a hexagon like this, you know that each point here is a carbon. And since it's a hexagon, six there's six points six points six carbons hence glucose is a six carbon sugar another popular monosaccharide is ribose and we're going to talk more about that when we talk about dna and rna the blueprint of who you are
especially the brain. Brain only makes glucose and oxygen. So if you try a fad diet that takes away either one of the three main nutrients that you have, and let's review the three main nutrients, fats, the carbohydrates, and proteins. Fad diets usually pick on one of them and try to eliminate them. But know and understand there must be a balance because just imagine if you – took all the fats away from your diet. All those things that he just described will now be what? Gone or minimized. And one of the really important things about fat is because you saw that cholesterol makes also what? Hormones. But again, I told you the story of my fraternity brother, Tiny, okay? He was not so tiny. He has too much fat. Too much fat is just as bad as too little. It's always about balance. This is what I was talking about. Lipase, which is an enzyme that breaks down fat, versus bile, which is an emulsifier. Bile doesn't change fat chemically. All bile does is a detergent. It takes a big fat globule and makes it little micelles, but it's still fat. But a lipase will do this to fat. They call it a triglyceride or your TGs. If you're looking at a blood sample, triglycerides are the equivalent to fat. Because if you look at it, you have glycerol backbone with three fatty acids. Hence the term, one, two, three, triglyceride. So when fat is exposed to lipase, what will it do? It'll break glycerol off and then form fatty, uh, fatty acids. And then it'll split it all up. So you can see the difference between a lipase and an emulsifier. Emulsifier doesn't change it chemically. It just changes the size of the fat. A lipase will actually change it chemically. And once this breaks all apart, it's no longer considered fat or a lipid. Fish. Um, there's a study done. Who eats the, who goes, who eats the most fish in this world? Typically Asians, typically Japanese. Because why do they have less Alzheimer's than we? Who, like myself, I'm a meditarian. Because when do I eat fish? Unless it's, unless it's fried and has chips next to it. And uh, that lovely, lovely tartar sauce. I ain't going to eat it. Right? Because, but then you see the, um, uh, the level of, of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders in this country versus other countries that have a better balanced diet. Um, but again, there's a give and take. Um, a Japanese culture also has a lot of stomach cancer. But you can see omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. You can't just take the squalene pills. 
it has to be what? Food. And the fish can't be fried. It has to be poached. Uh, like, you know, boiled. Uh, it's, um, but me, uh, I don't know. Me and fish. I can eat fish. It is tasty. But I'm a meditarian. Like, in, like I, I can eat like 20 of them. And I'm still so hungry. It's the American culture in me, I guess. Now, doesn't this look like a beautiful all of the above question? Which of the following is an example of a protein? Muscles and connective tissue? Yes. Ion channel and pump? Yes. Enzyme is also a protein. And we now know what enzymes do. They make things what? Faster. It has a reactant and then a product. So it's part of metabolism. Now, you may or may not remember ion channels and pumps. We talked about... Um, um, depolarization and repolarization. Uh, I think mentioned it briefly in medical terminology, and uh, maybe you guys, when you studied the heart, um, um, you studied a little bit about, you know, the little waves, the QRS. Do you guys remember that? that I mean, physiology one. So P wave matches to atrial depolarization. D means what? No or not. And uh, remember the story I told you about when, when, when my son, every time we um, do jumper cables, he's got to play with them, right? Even in his 20s, right? Typical Marine, you know, give him crayons, eat them, right? He grabs the, the little uh, clipper things, right? One of them is a plus, one is a minus. Do you see the pumps, how all the pluses are on one side or the other? Well, there should be minuses as well. Depolarization is when you take plus and minus and you put it together. And those of us who ever played around with or maybe accidentally put together the plus and minus of uh, the little clipper things on your um, jumper cables, what happened? Zip, zip, zip. You get what? Electricity. Just like, the, you know, the nine volt batteries, little square batteries? Well, rectangle batteries that you put in your, um, what do you call that, smoke alarm? If I put my tongue on the negative side only, will I feel anything? No. If I put my tongue on the positive side only, will I feel anything? Oh, please do not do this at home. But if I put my tongue on both the plus and minus, what will I feel? Oh, you'll feel a little what? A little shock. Same thing with your jumper cables. You can touch one, but if you touch both of them, they'll complete a circuit, and you're going to get zapped, and you're going to have a lovely uh, a trip to the emergency room. My son learned that the hard way, twice. Yeah, not once. Twice he touched these things. Now, other than the stupidity of my son, what could we learn here? If pluses and minuses get together, we make electricity. Remember the movie, The Matrix, the first one, the only good one, right? Remember when um, Morpheus was telling Neo, he goes, all we are are batteries. And we have sodium, which is a plus, chloride, which is a minus, right? You put it together, you make a what? A spark. <clears throat> and that's what ion channels and pumps do. They pump in minuses and pluses so that you either get a charge or you don't. So you, yes, you are electricity. And remember, in order for me to even move around, I have to have an electrical signal from my brain, down a nerve, then tells my muscles what to do. This should amaze you. Aren't you amazed that you remember things? I remember something, I don't remember what I did yesterday, but I remember playing on the beach when I was four. That is not only chemical, well, not it's chemical, it's also what? Pluses and minus are electrical. But let's say I substance abuse myself. Look, 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 look. I told you guys the story the two times I've been in Mardi Gras. I have no recollection 
absolutely none on both trips. Because what happened? You know, I'm 18 years old. I'm an, I'm an idiot. I'm a frat guy. So what did we do the second we got on the bus? Drink, 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 drink. What happened by the time we got down to um, uh, Louisiana? What happened to the chemicals? They didn't mess with these pups. They didn't mess with these enzymes. Yeah. Then now I have what? Major imbalance. Also, you take alcohol, it's a depressant. Don't you think it'll uh, now mess with uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide? You betcha. We'll do all of the above. Now, how do we break in that protein into a whole bunch of amino acids? Remember we talked about nucleases? Nucleases break down what? DNA. DNA and RNA. Are there DNA and RNA in meat? Yes. <coughs> and that's why a lot of people are now arguing that a lot of these genetically modified um, products that we get from uh, corporate farms is now messing with people. Uh, but again, the science, the, the, the evidence isn't there yet, but um, it is a hypothesis and it's something to look into because 30 years ago, autism was a footnote. Now it affects one in 42 boys. That should be frightening to every parent in this room or every future parent in this room. So when you're looking at that, you can see on any video, no matter whether it's entertaining or not, there are visual cues to tell you, hey, this is important, right? So one of those visual cues is if you see a list, if you see a hierarchy on the list, like what he did there, he numbered them, right? From the most abundant to the least. And remember, Health science and any science is also about what? Boundaries. So now you know what's the most important thing, water. But the least important, or the, the least amount of intake is carbohydrate. And it goes, um, so you can now see why diets can tend to uh, reduce the intake regarding carbohydrates. Now, just also uh, as a quick reminder, why do we care about vitamins so much? Remember we talked about enzymes? Vitamins are also called coenzymes. Vitamins help the enzymes go faster. But just like these nine essential amino acids, you can't just take a pill. That's why all the bros in the gym crack me up when they spend hundreds of dollars a month on those, um, those powders and shakes that have tons of whey protein and amino acids not going to help you. You should eat what? More. 
right? Having the supplement and those supplements should be just that, a supplement. So when you're taking, um, you're taking vitamins and minerals, it should be a backup, not the mainstay of your diet. But you see these people, you know, loading up on their powder. I see them every day in the gym. Crack me up because um, it's pseudoscience. And, and if they knew a little bit about science, they probably would have better gains. They, uh, they'd have probably, not probably, they'll definitely have better gains and better performance. Like, it's only now that they're figuring out, like, you don't work out every day. Uh, for decades, athletes work out every day, but your body needs time to recover. Remember the two cycles. You have anabolism, it's building up, and catabolism is breaking down. When you're actually working out, you are actually breaking things. Your muscle is actually tearing and falling apart. So that's why if you'd like... Um, Crossfitters are infamous for this. They, 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 they do something called wands or workouts of the day. And every workout is brutal. And it requires all muscle, um, um, all muscle groups. Now, just imagine you do that four days in a row. You'll get something called rhabdomyolysis. You'll have lysis of your muscle tissue. So you will not actually have gains. You will have losses. And you'll see protein actually leaking out into their urine. They get proteinuria. They even get hematuria, right? They live so hard that it pushes their kidneys past the brink. And it's not, it's not healthy. Um, I re I, um, science now is much better. I remember when I was in sports as a kid. When I was 15 on the wrestling team, I finally made varsity. There was a bucket in the corner of the room for we weren't allowed to leave, you were allowed to throw up. Uh, Coach Murata turned on the thermostat to 89. Three and a half hour sessions every day, five days a week, with two and a half hour sessions um, on Saturdays. And if we lost me, which almost we never did, it turned into four hours on Saturday. If we lost, I think during my senior year, we lost twice. And that he really made us pay physically. You can't do that anymore, right? That's abuse. And even Olympic athletes don't do that anymore. There has to be a cycle of what? Hard workout and then rest. Workout that goes then hard and then rest. Rest is just as important as as the workout itself. Um. So. Let's uh, da, 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 da. start this next video. So, in the first couple of minutes, he's just rehashing everything. So, if I took good notes in the first video, right, I'm re he's rehashing everything. Do I have to rewrite everything? No, I just leave it alone. It's another thing that I also uh, noticed. Um, 
uh, when I was across the way, I was uh, uh, teaching the nurses. They write everything down. Do you have to write everything down? No, you only write what's important. Now, right now, you can see he's in summary mode. We already talked about all of these things. So right now, your brain will semi-check out, but you're scanning to hear something new. And then this came up. This is new, right? He never talked about a pathology before. This is another road sign on how you know something's important in a lecture when it switches speeds or switches the topic. We were talking about anatomy, physiology, and some chemistry. Now he's talking pathology. So now you see this, what do you do? You wake up and go, oh, this is something important. All right, let's look at that because that's that is a very important um, law. Now, if it's a law, that means it's what? It's reality. <clears throat> so, and it then begs the question. So after goes after I'm done with my existence, where does all this stuff go? Right. Remember, energy can uh, it can be created nor destroyed. It, so it's there. It's just what? Modified. Right? You came from someplace else. You came from mommy and daddy, which they had energy. They provided the energy to you. You were born. And then what happens? Because when you die, everything gets what? Remember I talked about another law is called entropy. If I put, I put anything outside, well, sands, or maybe McDonald's, which, if I put most things outside, piece of paper, or even a wood block, even, even something metal. Over time, what will happen to the metal or that thing? It will erode and do what? Blow away. All the atoms and uh, molecules in the world want to do what? They want to spread out into the ether. They love diffusion. They love being from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And in order for something to be a substance, it requires energy, energy to be put into it. So for example, even though this table you and these chairs you're sitting on, they're not living things. It required energy to make, yes, either physical labor or some sort of machine to make and chemistry to do what? To make it. But I leave this desk outside, you leave it out there long enough, what will you see? Nothing. Right, you'll get eaten up, right? Um, if ever you've seen uh, like abandoned buildings, what will happen? They'll all eventually crumble, end up where? That's why everyone's like, oh, what happens to these lost civilizations? They get eaten up. Oh, what happened to all these people? Eventually they'll get what? all eaten up. So once you know and understand that, right? When you eat, you're not really creating any energy. You're just taking the calories that are in that sandwich or in that meal and then converting it into what? Things to do. So now when you're looking at diet and maintenance of health, I'm living the American lifestyle. I'm eating way too much and brutally honest about that. So what must I do? It must do what? Do you see some of your professors out there, especially the thinner ones? They're thinner for a reason because at lunch, I'm at McDonald's and where are they? They're they're not only eating salad, they're doing what? You see them all walking around, you know, uh, outside on our lunch time. Me, I'm in my car going, going chomping down on whatever McDonald's I got for that day, depending on what coupon I have, right? So what are they doing? All eat, they did they eat a lot? No, they ate what salad or whatnot. And what are they doing to it? They're burning it. Right? What do I do? I sit down. 
right? And that's why I purposely now do what? I try to do my lectures standing up, I try to at least move around a little bit so I can burn something. Not much, but what do I actually have to do every day? You have to, well, every, every other day, depending on how my joints are. You have to, according to the American Heart Association, three times a week, 30 to 40 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, or whatever that may be. And you got to get your heart rate uh, above 80%. How do you calculate 80%? You take the number 220, you minus your age, and then multiply it by 0.80. So what, I'm 50, uh, 220 minus 50, that's 170. 80% of 170 is what? Uh, 130, 140 people a minute. So when I'm on the treadmill, I better be trucking it. That means, <clears throat> do I have enough energy to talk to somebody? This is, this is actually a good thing regarding running or doing any exercise. If you can speak to your neighbor like, hey, hi, what's going on? How's your day? You're not burning squat. You're, you're burning some things, but what's better? And you're on the treadmill and you're going and you don't have to run. How's this? Put the incline at six, seven, eight percent and walk three miles an hour. You and do that for 30 minutes. It's it's rough. Uh, and how's this? You want another challenge? Instead of doing it on a treadmill, go outside and um, do what my son does. They do uh, um, forced marches. They put 45, 50 pounds of um, weight in their rucksack in their little uh, backpack, and then they walk for 40 miles. They walk as fast as they can for 40 miles. Well, he's in his 20s, he can do that. But me, what, what can I do? I can at least get on the treadmill 40 minutes, three times a week, around uh, eight, eight and a half incline, and walk what? Three, 3.1, 3.1 is pushing it for me. I'm like, oh. so when I'm, if my neighbor asks me a question, this is how I will be talking because I'm using up oxygen to create energy, to make ATP. So, hey, how you doing? Hey, hi. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going. But if you're, because if you're having a full sentence, um, the energy that you are burning for the, and it's a simple formula. In order to, uh, to lose weight, the energy that you are burning must exceed the, the energy that you're intake. Now, you notice you repeated this in the second video. So that question's got to come out, doesn't it? Don't have to memorize this, but it makes sense. I've got to eat, right? That's the glucose. I've got to breathe. That's the oxygen. Now, what am I exhaling? Carbon dioxide. And what happens when I work out? Don't I sweat? So I have to release what? Some water. That's why when you go to the gym, well, don't be like one of the bros you know, with their little amino acid bucket drinks. How would you get a drink? Big, big jug, right? Or this one woman brought a heated thermos to the gym. The, other. the stuff, in the last 30 years, the stuff that I've been, I've been a gym rat 30 plus years. I've been a gym rat since I was, what, 15, 16, because I wanted to bulk up, I wanted to get in varsity. You know, when you're a kid, you do stupid stuff, right? So, she brought an actual, you know, like one of those big thermoses that you plug in? She had soup in it or something. It's the most insane thing I saw. Well, not really. Every night there's an insane thing. But that's why I love science, because it's not insanity. It's the only thing in this universe that makes total sense, right? This other dude in the other gym was singing at the top of his lungs. It's bad enough people grunting and like showing up, like mm -hmm, making all these noises. 
the guy was full blown singing while he was squatting. And I'm sitting there like, I can, I can hear him over my noise canceling headphones. He, I can only, and people were asking him, hey, hey dude, can you tone it down? And he was like, oh, no problem. And then he'd go back to singing. But I love this because it makes total sense. I eat, I breathe, I exhale CO2, and I spit. Not hard. So let's pause right now, uh, 9.20, because it's break time. And let's take a quick 10 minutes. And then we'll finish up the video and then relate the video to the lecture. And then we'll do some uh, questions, preguntas. My fraternity brothers are shaming me for not speaking Spanish. I hate um, them so much. My phone is not working and I cannot get into my campus. Um, go, oh, well, is there an alternative email that they can send to you? Like, you it doesn't give you the option for an email. It gives you yeah. the text or call. And for some right. reason, my phone is not working. All right. Oh, uh, try resetting your phone. Okay. Um, you know, you hard, you got an iPhone? Yeah. Hard reset it yep. and see what happens. All right. That's my answer for everything. Did you turn it off and on it again? Yeah, pretty much. That's it. That's pretty much IT. In a nutshell. Man, when am I not going to be sick? It's been years. I knew I was going to be sick too. Because the other night, remember the other night, it was like 50, it was like Friday or Saturday night, it was like 50 yeah. degrees. So the bar thought, hey, let's open all the bay doors oh because we, we had a decent crowd going and it was warm. The second they opened all the doors, I'm like, oh man. And I, I was, I only had a t-shirt on and I'm going, oh, this is will not, will not bode well. Then we did double gigs on Saturday and got home at four. That's never a good thing. <laughs> did everyone sign in the sign in sheet? Spring break. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's on the website. Let's see. I need to know. <laughs> oh, turn start previous term. So we started when? The 20th. 23rd. Mm -hmm. So 2023 term one. Um, Looks like there's a summer break in July. Christmas break. There's no spring break. Oh, that's messed up. Let me ask you.
All righty. Let's continue with our video. Oh, we go back to this. So we really know this. And remember, there were three types of respiration that we learned from um, unit three. You, of course, have external, which is your breathing, the atmospheric air, and that's between the air and your lungs. You have your internal respiration, that's in between your alveoli and your uh, capillaries. And of course, your arteries, and veins and the rest of your uh, organ system. But this is cellular respiration. So that means glucose and oxygen have to go inside the cell. Remember insulin? So whoever's doing diabetes, this is something to consider, isn't it? Because if this isn't going inside my cell, it goes, am I getting the energy that I'm requiring to make? Because remember, we start off with what? Glycolysis, then the TCA Krebs cycle, and then oxidative phosphorylation, also known as the electron transfer chain, and that happens in the mitochondria, and all of that is inside the cell, and that's called cellular respiration. So oxygen has to go in, carbon dioxide has to go out. Also, water has to go out. So that's what this formula is. How did they go through that so fast? So that is the reason why I have to breathe and I have to eat. This is also the reason why I also have to exhale because the CO2 has to go out. That's why I perspire. That's why there's actually water vapor that comes out when I breathe because at the end of the day, what am I making? ATP. Fuel, that's how I live. That's how your muscles move. And if you're alive, remember I said, stated, how do you know that someone's dead? The cold. We take a temperature of their liver, and if it's not of a proper temperature, that means the person is what? Declared dead or not living. And you could see how as long as these things start coming, it'll move down this direction. If you're not breathing, and it goes, if you're not eating, this direction can't continue. This is essentially life that you're looking at here. And it's organic chemistry. And all it is, it's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Which, by the way, your desk is made out of the same thing. What's the difference? We convert energy. Your desk doesn't do anything. It's inert. It just sits there. And remember, that's anatomy and physiology one, or unit one and two, when we, when you talked about when we break down sugars. And oh, by the way, the TCA Krebs cycle, remember you talked about those amino acids? They get recycled in there. And last but not least, the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, that's what makes the ATP.
Doesn't that look familiar? Doesn't that look like insulin and glucagon? The absorbed through state, right? My, my blood sugar is high. Therefore, I need insulin to put that sugar inside the cell so that we can continue with cellular respiration. But the post-absorptive state, my body is now running out of supply. So we have to get stuff from what? Storage. Does this look like a beautiful question? I think so. The BMR. Stop this. Look at those words. Glycogen and lysis. Lysis means breakdown. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in your liver. Glycogenesis, genesis, creation. For those of you who are Christians in the room, the first Bible, first book of the Bible. Is the creation. So pause and ask yourself, when do I have glycogenolysis? I have glycogenolysis if I'm in my post-absorptive state. My blood sugar is down. I need to open up the stores in my liver. Therefore, I have to lyse or break down glycogen. So that's what this is. Now, glycogenesis, I'm in the absorbed state. Ate a ton of food. I have to put the food away for a rainy day. So I'm going to make or create some glycogen. And that's what glycogenesis. And you can see how glycogenesis makes a whole bunch of chains of fatty acids and glucose. I mean, um, uh, glucose, fatty acids, makes a whole bunch of glucose chains. But glycogenolysis, you can see it breaks down into all these little six carbon sugars.
So when you're thinking of cholesterol, don't think of it as like fat. It's a vehicle. It's actually a lipoprotein. It's a thing that's made out of a little bit of fat and a little bit of protein, and it carries things. The so-called good cholesterol, or HDL, carries fat out of the body, out of the system. That's why we call it high-density lipoprotein, and that's why we call it the good cholesterol. And the LDL and VLDL, which is low-density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein very low density lipoprotein. Those are sim merely vehicles to bring fat into the body. Now, be wondering, why do we have, we don't have too many vehicles bringing fat out of our body? And we have so many vehicles bringing fat into our body. And the answer to that is because of cave person days. During cave person days, when's the next time you're gonna eat? You don't know. Right, you may have caught a lot. Uh, you may have caught some great food Monday, but nothing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So, the metabolism of human beings is geared more for storage. A couple of thousand years later, now we're in the world of what? I get in my car. Everything's convenient. Um, a lot of fast food that's fat laden is open 24 hours a day, and our lifestyle is not conducive uh, to burning energy, but it's conducing, conducive to storing it. Now, you could see how like, uh, eating larger meals is not advantageous to the chemistry of your body. And also, eating large fat-laden meals is also not conducive. So, and, and that was Dr. Zhao's thing. Like, why we as Americans have to eat so much when you could eat much, much, uh, much, much less. And now there are some papers that are even saying that um, especially for your patient that is in the sedentary state, 500 to 700 calories per day is still actually viable uh, for life. Because if you're not moving, you're not burning anything, why should you be take, intaking a lot of things? Um, you can all, you. what was the other point I was going to make? What was the last thing he said? 
<clears throat> Regarding insulin and diabetes, type one diabetic needs the insulin because the type one diabetic, their problem is um, a, a congenital defect of making insulin. But a type two diabetic doesn't necessarily need insulin. A type two diabetic, the problem with a type two diabetic is the receptor is broken. They have more than enough insulin, but the receptor is no longer sensitive to insulin and it doesn't open the doors for glucose to get in. But good news, we can control the diet, therefore, decrease the amount of uh, glucose that comes in. That's number one. And number two, remember what we talked about exercise. Regular exercise at least three times a week for at least 40 minute cycles where your heart rate is. Um, uh, is at 80% of its max or higher, according to the American Heart Association, because you should be able to get that uh, sugar inside. Because when you work out, there are other doors that open up. So when we look at the video, you can see now, and then we look at the actual uh, lecture, you can see there's, there's themes that come out. And there's certain things that come out and I put them in questions, which we're going to go over in a minute. But let's look um, let's look over uh, the lecture proper and let's see all the stuff that it matches. Over here and slideshow. So we already know ATP, I need food. And what is metabolism? It is all the reactions. So if I ask what metabolism is, is it catabolism A, anabolism B, C, both A and B? It's both. It's everything. Meta is how we change ever I'm intaking to bull growth, ism, state or condition. State and condition of change and growth. Now, whoopsies. Catabolism is breakdown. So if you see, you have, um, let's say I have my cheeseburger. I wanted to break it down into different products. I'll separate it out. And anabolism, I take um, ingredients like glucose and oxygen. And then what can I make? I can make uh, ATP. Isn't this a um, um, this is a synthesis reaction? Isn't this a decomposition reaction that you learned in Anatomy and Physiology one? Yep. And both of these things are happening at the same time. You are building up stuff and you're breaking down stuff all at the same time. And all of that is called metabolism. We, what are the three steps in order to make ATP? First, I have to break down the sugar. That's glycolysis, glucose. Then I have the, um, <clears throat> the Krebs TCA cycle. And then I have the electron transfer chain. Who's the number one that makes the most ATP? the electron transfer chain, and it's in the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It makes ATP. You have aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. So of course, aerobic, glycolysis, Krebs, electron transfer chain, that makes the most ATP. But you also have anaerobic, which is only glycolysis, and that doesn't make much. That's why when you work out, when you lift, you should do what? Breathe. Um, uh, those of you, you want to improve your running, you learn how to properly breathe when you run. Um, my running didn't get better until uh, I was in my 30s. I went into a running clinic, and all they did was breathing exercises. So I was sitting there in a the parking lot in Manassas going, what are we doing? This is a waste of time. I gave him 50 of my bucks to listen to this hoo-ha just because this guy was sort of Olympic runner. But you know what? My running partner says, have faith. Let's do these exercises. It shaved off 20 minutes 
all off of my uh, my 10 mile runs. And I was so, and it's because why? What makes more energy? Oxygen, right? That's why if you don't breathe very well, or how's this? We just talked about last week. If you have a lower respiratory tract infection, how is your ability to make energy? Like right now, I have a lower respiratory tract. In, well, it's upper going into lower. Once this thing goes lower, don't you think I'm going to be tired, achy? Yeah, sure. Lipogenesis, essential fatty acids. Now, where do you get these essential fatty acids? And fish oils. Notice we didn't say pills. 20 years ago, do you guys remember? Some of you are barely 20. So you guys remember there were squalene pills and people were eating like uh, fish oil pills? Remember when that was a thing? Well, we found out what? Uh, when you eat fish oil pills, guess what you get in the toilet? Fish oil. But if you eat poached fish that still has the oil, the oils in it and not the oil that you fried it in, what happened to people's blood pressure? Went down, right? What happened to people's cholesterol? went down and you could see now it was a better choice for lipid synthesis and a cleaner form of what fats and it's the reason and 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 it's the reason why and I and I and I say this not to be funny I came here in the 70s I never saw an obese Filipino when I was a kid I now go back to my home country I, I was afraid because last time I went home, because the one thing, one thing Filipino families are, are brutal. Like when they see you, they don't, they don't, here in the American culture, we always do what? Oh, you look good, even though you don't, right? Philippines, they, the first thing they look at you, oh my God, you got so old. Look at your face. And I'm like, oh, tita, I'm not that old. Oh, you look like an old man. And then, then my nieces and nephews start touching the belly. And then they were like, Oh, rub it for good luck. He's like a Buddha. And I'm sitting there, like, my, my ego is now, I'm at the airport. It's supposed to be a happy time, but my ego is crushed, right? But you know what? They're right. It's too much. Because I'm 205 pounds. I'm barely 5'4", even with platform shoes, I'm 5'4". Right? And you're not supposed to be that heavy. And, 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 and it's, it's a, not a good thing. So... When you eat your essential fatty acids, because we, we're talking about what? Not pills, but food and, and, and good food. Lipoproteins, we already know what are the good and the bad one, right? HDL, supposedly the good. It's, there's no good or bad. It's not like good or bad bacteria. But remember, we have to learn these terms because our patients know these terms, right? Just know that HDLs, are just lipoproteins that carry fats out of the body. LDL and VLDL carry fats where? Into the body. They're merely vehicles. So when you see your cholesterol on a, um, on a, on a blood test, it's not really the level of fat you have. It's just that your body now is telling the report that you have a, your, your, eat, your diet is a lot. Another big thing is what? Your level of triglycerides. Because remember, what do we break down fats into? Triglycerides. So if, if you have a lot of fats, your triglycerides will also be increased. And let's talk about the big one. Glycosylated hemoglobin, also known as hemoglobin A1C. Okay? That's, uh, that's the one that you know, goes, uh, talks about Remember hemoglobin? It carries oxygen and carbon dioxide, yes? Well, another thing that hemoglobin, well, this specific type of hemoglobin does, is carry glucose. So let's say, for example, for the last three months, even though I lost some weight, lost a couple of pounds, but I've been eating McDonald's every other day religiously, like my life depended on. And I go to the doctor and go, hey, doc, hey, you like that? I lost four pounds, buddy. Come on. You got to give it up. You got you to gotta give me a hug, right? Dr. Bashir is going to look at me and go, he looks at my A1C. It's abnormal. It should be, what, 5, 5, 5, 4 uh, for my age. It's 6, 2. 
6.2 is borderline diabetic. And he's looking at me like, what did I tell you? You got to lay off the Big Macs. And I'm like, no. Oh. And he goes, hey, come on, doc. No, but look at my weight. I tried to do what my patients tried to do to me. And you know, Bashir put his hand on my shoulder and goes, and he goes, and he goes, you either stupid. He goes, oh, you're delusional. Which one is it? And I go, well, I'm stupid. <laughs> I'll try not to eat Big Macs. You know what I did later on that afternoon? You went to McDonald's. No, I went to Wendy's because it was close. I didn't want to drive a whole extra minute. And also, Wendy's was paying more fat. Ugh. But again, I'm trying. I'm, I'm balancing. I was good. Last night's dinner, I ate uh, like natural peanut butter, which tastes like garbage. Ever eat like natural peanut butter? without the salt, without all the extra sugar, it tastes like garbage. I miss my Skippy. Mmm, so much sugar. You can, you can get hyperglycemic just on Skippy. So you can see there are tests. So get to your patient. Don't bother lying to us. We know everything. The tests, and you can't, science doesn't lie. So if your HDL and LDL is high, that means what? your dietary intake of fat is high. If your hemoglobin A1C, the glycosylated hemoglobin is high, that means for the last 90 days, you have been bad, right? And uh, what's the other one? Triglycerides. If your total triglycerides are increased, guess what? That means your fat intake has been what? Increased. That's why I just tell patients, just don't lie to me, it's, it's useless. Because I, I see it coming. But I tried to pull something over Dr. Bashir because I need to get off some of these meds because they're killing me. The only way to do that is eat better. Essential amino acids, uh, non-essential amino acids. Remember, what makes a protein? Let's bring it back to anatomy and physiology one. A protein is made out of a whole bunch of amino acids in a specific sequence connected by peptide bonds. Remember we talked about pepsin, peptide, pepsin breaks down peptide bonds, breaks down proteins, and proteins are everywhere. They're in everything. And the only difference is, is the order of all of this stuff. It's the only thing. Protein deficiency disorder. Uh, PKU, um, oh, you get you have PKU. Uh, it'll give you um, uh, metric retardation because if just if my newborn doesn't have all the amino acids to produce important things like these neurotransmitters, uh, we'll learn more. Uh, no, you guys already had uh, neuro, right? You guys nervous system? No, not yet. Oh, then that's probably with me then. Just know that we already talked about the nervous system is electrical and chemical. We already know about depolarization and repolarization. That's the electrical part. But there's also a chemical part, which is these proteins called neurotransmitters. And maybe you heard of some of them. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, melanin. Um, uh, you guys know that it's directly related to mood directly related to um, um, uh, a lot of psychiatric disorders like dopamine and norepi and serotonin, which by the way, 35 million people are on drugs that simulate these three things. What do you think we found out and we've known for the last 15 years? Regular exercise as maintained by the American Heart Association increases dopamine, serotonin, and goes and norepinephrine levels, right? Those of you who do work out regularly, you've never had a bad workout, have you? Because after you work out, you're at least, hey, at least I did something, right? And also when you go to the gym, you know, you do a couple sets, maybe you didn't get the full pump, right? You know the gym mirrors and the gym lighting is not like your house. Go flex in your house and you're like, oh, oh. Don't like looking at the mirror in my house. The mirror in the gym, I'm like, Look at that. I just ignore everything around here. And I'm like, oh, okay, cut. Not really cut. It's like the lights are just perfect, right? And the mirrors, um, 
a friend of, I told you uh, one of my really good friends, uh, uh, Cam. And if you guys need any um, personal training, especially he specializes in uh, geriatrics, people who are 65 years and older. Uh, and he is 55 and in amateur, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, weightlifting, weightlifting champion at 55. He started this sport when he was 48. So that's telling you something. I mean, he and I, we were, we were in martial arts together, and he's always been an athlete, but he was like a, a smaller dude. Now it's freaky to see a stacked 55-year-old who's super, super natty because he, he's like me. He hates chemicals, doesn't like meds, doesn't, doesn't believe in vaccines. <laughs> we, just don't, we just don't like uh, 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 meds. And he's he's all about what keto and living, and he got my friends to become vegetarians, which is sad because every time we go to dinner, I can't eat very well. So annoying. Always going eating veggie stuff. I like vegetarian food. Afterwards, I'm like, okay, where's the rest of the meal? Is it right? You know, you have some couscous, you have some rice, and you're like, okay, where's the where's the steak? Bring, every time we go to dinner, me and my wife like go to McDonald's or Wendy's because I'm not enough me. DNA, RNA. Now, what's DNA, RNA? Just as a quick review. Remember, the DNA is the blueprint of who you are. Remember what that crash course guy Alton said? The majority of what you are is made out of proteins. And the only difference between one protein and another protein is that the order of the amino acids. Who do you think dictates that order? DNA. DNA knows everything about you. It knows when you were born. It knows when you're going to die. Yes, it knows when you're going to die. Everything in your body is timed. And DNA knows all of this. DNA to RNA. And let me go through the dance just to make sure that you guys get all straight. So remember, inside here is the nucleus. We'll make outside. I guess this will demarcate outside. So this is the nuclear membrane. That's outside. We're still inside the cell, but this is the nucleus. So what happens in the nucleus? What does the DNA always do? Making copies. So imagine DNA making copies. But so once it makes copies, it hands over the copy to mRNA. And mRNA is the messenger. So the messenger will do what? He or she will write it down. And when you write something down, isn't that transcribing? When you're a scribe, don't you write it down? So that's transcription. That's messenger RNA. Now, the messenger RNA now is going to give it to the outside. Who's outside? The tRNA, right? Or the transfer RNA. Now, the transfer RNA then will do what? Translate. And remember the ribosomes? The ribosomes then speak their language so that the proper order of the amino acids will then get to the ribosome for the protein maker. So you have DNA copy, messenger RNA, transcription. Transfer RNA, translation. Then take the protein, ribosome. Sound familiar from last term? And that's what this is. And that specific order has to keep intact because if not, that's when you get stuff like PKU, that's when you get stuff like Down syndrome, that's when you get all the genetic diseases. Oh, by the way, remember we talked about viruses? Viruses are extra nasty. What do they do? They come in and then do what? Remember the messenger RNA transcribing? Virus comes in. No, 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 listen to that. Listen to this. Make more virus. You don't have to do what you have to do. You don't need to make proteins. You need to make more viruses. That's why viruses are extra nasty. And remember, the balanced diet. I can't just have carbs. I just can't have just lipids. I can't just have proteins. It has to be a balance. And for those of you who are going to move up and on, you're going to have um, more nutrition classes so that you, want, especially the clinical people, have to understand why we give what we give to our patient. 
How many of you here like the food in the hospital? Anybody? Anyone like the oh, best restaurant I've ever been to? You like the food? Good. Yeah. Okay, that's you, right? <laughs> I can't stand it, right? But is the food in the hospital, good. is it function to make it taste good? You're like my wife. My wife goes, I like the pancakes. And I go, these are the chalkiest things I've ever eaten. Last time I was in the hospital, I was like dying in there. I was, Can someone go across the street to IHOP, get me some real fucking pancakes? For the money I'm spending here at Inova, I think I deserve some syrup, just a little. My wife goes, no, because why? The food in the hospital is counted by the calories, and it's there for medication. It's not there for you to enjoy. Therefore, when your kids come in the room, kindly refrain from eating grandpa's food because dietetics, we look at, because we look at that, we look at what got eaten, and then we calculate what? Calories, because remember, your food is what? Energy. And then the energy has to also be expended, expendable. So if we see like uh, the kids ate all the food and we think grandpa ate the food, it becomes problematic when the dietitian has to do the math or the nurse. But I think the dietitians nowadays, they, all, they do all the math for that. Nursing doesn't have to do that anymore. But nurses know how to do it, know how to count, to my knowledge. So everything must be what? In balance. And even if you're a vegetarian, you can be in balance without meat. There are other protein derivatives uh, uh, that's just as good. And I can tell you anecdotally, uh, my uh, uh, friends and family members who've switched over to a little bit more of a vegetarian lifestyle, they lost weight, they look better, they sleep better anecdotally, but me, Culture-wise, I just can't wrap around it. I just can't. I don't know. I got rid of a whole bunch of addictions, but food and soda, I love. You know how easy it was to quit liquor? I just said what? Eh, not have it anymore. But you know how hard it is to quit Coca-Cola? Like, I had to wean my, I'm trying to wean myself off. Like, I'm trying not to drink Coke every day and, like, mix it with, like, Sprite, like, Coke, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You think I'm joking? Some of you are looking at me. Is he joking? No, I'm not joking. Because I can't. I have to have soda every day. At least a can of it. In, you should try. You should try those little mini ones. Then I drink two mini ones. The mini ones cost more. On the my wife did that. She bought me whole mini ones, and then the next thing I know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I just drank five minis. This is not good, right? Uh, but yeah, I'm getting better. Right, so what I do now is every time I go to fast food, I bring my kids. Those of you who have children, yeah, I know you'll probably ruin your kids, but my children, they're good with juices and stuff. They learn to dilute the juice. So if they have Kool-Aid, if you make it too much, they'll dilute it. But here's the funny part. They all can drink Coca-Cola like it's no one's business if you let them, which is weird, right? So that means what? There's gotta be chemicals in there or something in there. The sugar in there is too powerful. That's why um, now my experiment now with the babies, the five-year-old and the two-year-old have never tasted Coke. They never tasted any soft drink. And I wanna see how long I could do this. Because the, the other ones, I, uh, they, they, I, they're only allowed like at parties or whatever. And, and it's kind of beautiful because um, I'm coming from a, um, like a, a alcoholic and very, uh, Coke and coffee laden family. My two eldest, my two adults, um, they don't drink coffee and uh, they don't drink alcohol. It's weird. Because, and in a family of what? Coffee drinkers, Coke drinkers, and bourbon drinkers, um, they, they, we broke, well, in what appears we broke the chain. And it's nice. It's nice to see. And my son's a Marine, you know Marines. He's probably the only Marine who's like, hey, you want a beer? He'll be like, okay. He'll take one sip and he'll milk it. He'll have that beer next to him the whole night. Well, meanwhile, the rest of his unit, uh, they're all crazy. Question? Yeah. Oh. So it's just very interesting that it's what? It's just behaviors can be broken, which is very easy. Not, not, not very easy, but it's easy, easy concept 
but a very difficult thing to do in practice. So all of us have our little addictions and stuff like that. What do we all have to try to do? Like try to do what? Just break it down, get it little, little, little. Anyone here smoke? No? I smoke for 14 years. I love it. Even to this day, when you guys smoke outside, I take an extra lap <laughs> just to remember what it was like. Even menthols. I mean, I guess, uh, but you know how I did it? The last four years I was smoking, I smoke like 18 sticks a day. So January 18, February 17. It goes uh, March 16 to 15. It took two and a half years, but little by little. Then once I got it down to like five, six a day, I started noticing I was only smoking every other day. And then I started noticing I was only smoking in the afternoon and never in the morning. And then all of a sudden, I just don't want to smoke anymore. I stopped buying stuff. And it's really weird. I mean, because now, do you see how you just wean yourself off of it? And that's actually how it started. I was like, what, 13, 14 years old? Somebody, I remember my best friend, Rich Batista, gave me a cigarette. He goes, hey, someone gave me some cigarettes. And I'm like, you want to smoke them? And of course, we're in a club illegally, right? So we're in the back, we smoke the cigarette. Next thing you know, I'm buying, a, like, it was not even a week later, I'm, I'm buying a pack for myself. And back then, you know, 14, you're not supposed to be able to get cigarettes. But I, you just, in New York City, you just walk in because, yeah, I'm getting them for my dad, which I was. And I was also getting another pack for myself. But, again, break the cycle. It's nice because, yeah, majority of Garias males, all of us drink. And the majority of the Garias women smoke. So how do you think all the health is for the older people in my family? Not very good. But you break the cycle for the younger people, and it's a mixed bag. You can see here, everything is what? Is in the, this thing, choose my plate and all that stuff, it changes from year to year depending on what theory is, is going out. But whatever, whatever uh, diet you choose, make sure that it is what? It is balanced and based on science. And how do I know? Well, we're going to be talking about APA, citation. When you look up things, you find legitimate sites, right? So, uh, like, choosemyplate.gov is what? A government-sanctioned site? Or you look up Department of Health, uh, National Institute of Health and Dietetics. You, That's where you get your source. But if it's like, um, you know, davesfoodadventure.com, right, where he, some guy who's, I don't know, um, you know, just making stuff up for the sake of it. Oh, uh, look at that. Look how shocking this is. I don't think I even drink two glasses of water a day. And this thing states what? I should be drinking two and a half liters a day. I can drink two and a half liters of Coke a day, <laughs> if you let me. But water? So if I know that's my daily requirement, did I even need a study telling me that we're, America is dehydrated? I don't, right? And especially if you're coughing and you've got a fever, what are you going to do? You've got to drink more water because it'll be more water that gets released. Now, long-term issues, of course, it makes sense. Now, obesity, <clears throat> for years, we've been trying to get away with, because America in general, we're, 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 we're all about, you know, um, a lot of superficial things, especially a younger person, how I look. And that's why now we're having a backlash of, you know, a big is beautiful, when I counsel my patients, especially regarding obesity, it is not how you look, right? So a lot of people ask me, like, oh, as a physician, how do you feel about, you know, Lizzo and her politics and, and fat shaming? And, then, and I said, it's, it's not what you look like 
that it shouldn't be the issue. It's how you feel, right? And also ability. So there's an um, uh, an obesity because is not good for any of us. And also, there's also affluenza. Have you ever heard that term? Right. We live in a very fruitful and very lovely country, right? Where there's a lot of food, a lot of opportunity. But with that comes what? Um, um, a lot of diseases. Like obesity, heart and vascular disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Right? So we have to be careful of that, especially those of us children, because um, there's a Chinese proverb, and I don't speak Mandarin, but it clearly states this. Because if the parent doesn't deal with their with their demons, the demons will be passed on to their children. Now, because I don't know if they really meant demons, but when I read that proverb, it tells me what? Whatever, um, because who taught you how to eat? Whoever raised you, right? Who taught you how to be, how to live? Whoever raised you. And whoever goes, and if your parents raised you and they're obese, then what are the chances you're going to be obese? <coughs> if you led a, um, um, uh, an affluent um, lifestyle, right? Then what are the odds you're going to be? Like, um, uh, like, did you ever watch, and it's probably exaggerated, but if you've ever watched, uh, uh, like, um, it's an old show. Remember MTV? They had these crazy shows. And I used to love, uh, was it My Sweet 16? Nightmare or whatever, right? And also, also because uh, I've been in the DJ business for 30 years, I'm just very interested in what sound production, what lighting production did they have, how over the top it goes. Well, do you see these kids? Like they walk in and they're like, when am I going to get my Bentley? Where's my Bentley? And you're like, Bentley? You know, less than 1% of the population in this country makes enough money to buy a Bentley, even a used one. Um, out of all of my colleagues, um, I think I have uh, uh, only one or two of us has a Bentley, and she was uh, that was given to her by her father when he passed. It's not; it wasn't. She didn't buy it. Her father bought it years ago, and she gave it to him. So th this um, the the culture of this unrealistic expectation of um, I had another student last term. When I asked, like, okay, what do you? We were on academic counseling. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go into this, this, and and probably go into nursing. And I go, then what are your aspirations? What kind of nurse do you want to be? And she goes, whatever nurse that'll give me one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And I'm like, excuse me. And I go, where did you get that number? And she goes, oh, that's how much uh, this or this type of nurse makes. And I go, at the tail end of your career, and after you know four hundred thousand dollars worth of school. Right? Again, if you if you were raised with an unrealistic expectation of what diet and what healthy living is, that's affluenza. And those of you those of you are kids, is it? You remember how hard it was growing up and how hard it was growing up for your parents. It's very very hard to simulate that for a child who grew up here. I, I love this. I'm, I've been living now in Fairfax for like eleven years. Eleven going on twelve now. I love this place. I love this place dearly, but it's very nice, isn't it? Right? Um, uh, there's like little, like Fairfax, there's little to no crime. There's nothing. And I grew up in the Bronx in the 70s. Look it up. It was a bad, bad place to grow up. It was scary on so many levels. Um, they lit our apartment. My landlord lit our apartment on fire for insurance. The second time he did it, me and my sister were still in the building. Right? That's the kind of place I grew up. So you grow up in a kind of place like that. You grow up a little bit, you know, on the tough side. But my two youngest ones grew up in where? Like the nicest place in the world where, where everyone's cool. And, you know, there's, you know, there's no, there's not even bullying. I actually wish there was some bullying, you know, toughen the kid up a little bit. But you could see how culture not only affects what? Mental, physical, psychiatric. It also can affect what? Diet. 
That's why if I don't get this thing under control, I am going to switch my culture to a more vegetarian culture, which is against my meditarian principles. This is really rough. But hey, got to do it. Especially those of you who have children, you know that you don't really live for yourself anymore. You already live for them already because, you know, I have family members who didn't, who didn't grow up with their parents and they had a rough time of it. So I'd like to, I'd like to be around a little while longer. So what happens? The machine gets worse with age. I know that's a horrible thing, to, but does it have to? If you know this is going to happen, what can you now do? You can now start adjusting. Nutritionally required quality and balance of food. Food doesn't change with age. Like, I still try to eat like I was when I was 17. But now, when I'm older, I have to now eat what? Better. Caloric requirement does not decrease, of course, right? So it has to now decrease, which is hard. Need for calcium and vitamin D decrease, it does increases. So why do you think more older people now what? Take more walks. Taking a walk in the mall is all well and good. But where do you get your vitamin D from? You get it from UV radiation outside. That UV radiation then converts into calcium, and that's what we need. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So you walking around will help your skeletal system. That's why I'm walking around now, because I have a little bit of a gout in my knee and my left toe. Right? I could sit and take more and more meds to get rid of the pain and whatever, but what's better? Moving around, right? And then you're moving around, and I'm not thinking about the pressure. Not really pain, it's more like a little pressure right here. Now, here's, the, here's the, also the other issue that you also have to contend with with your patient. If your patient is from a lower socioeconomic uh, income and culture, do you think they will have uh, the education and resources that your other more well-to-do patients will have? So, and especially with the diet. Uh, remember, I, uh, was this the group I told you guys I, I no longer go on medical missions abroad? I used to go on medical missions abroad um, at least once a year. I don't do that anymore because we need help here in America and not too far away from here. The Ozarks are not far away from here. Baltimore and DC is not far from right here. So if you got some time, volunteer uh, or shoot me an email, I could get you to some of the uh, um, uh, um, uh, places that I do, um, I do missions with because many people, um, and Professor Zhao did a wonderful, uh, that's how she, got her doctorate. She lived for several years in the Dakotas on the reservation with natives, right? And who else? What other population is lower socioeconomic than the Plains Indians in South Dakota and North Dakota? There's no opportunities there. There is nothing up there. And she documented how they live on 7-Eleven food. Everyone from the baby on up to grandma and grandpa. So how do you think, goes, what do you think she found? She found a lot of what? Malnutrition. Which, by the way, last time I went, goes, uh, remember I told you guys I found Kwashiorkor a couple of years back? Uh, I found signs and symptoms of malnutrition right here in D.C. I did a medical mission uh, uh, with the Church of Guiding Light uh, in um, the route of Bethesda. We were in Baltimore. What well, was supposed to be a, a four or five hour mission turned into 13 hours. I saw me personally four cases of Kwashiorkor. That is malnutrition because these particular patients were uh, uh, lower on the socioeconomic spectrum. So what happens? They're not eating right. Not eating right. You do it chronically or for a long period of time, you're going to have signs and symptoms of what? 
of uh, malnutrition. The same kind of stuff that I saw when I was in the Sudan, same, and that's Northern Africa, the same kind of stuff I saw when I was in Eritrea. But you know what's sad? It's right here, not even an hour away from this very school. You could see the same exact madness. And it's just what? Right? But then once, they, once, uh, once the food kitchens start telling them about the different programs, we started handing out pamphlets, we started telling them, eat this, not that. You know, don't you think? And these people, will they ever go to a clinic? Free clinics? You ever see a free clinic? The one in Alexandria has three hour wait, wait times. It, I used to send all my medical assistants there, all of them, because they need the help. Uh, um, and they'd be there all day, every day. So let me hop off my soapbox. And that is the uh, nutrition lecture. So let me stop recording.